kokoshite te he e ko ndara maha a a ala moya shi e ke te e he shi shi andela mohaya motonde le he ke ai o de da ma shi te te he la mohoya maha ke te onde le moha shi onto tola maha te la moshia I am, I was, and I always will be. I am the Lord. There is none before me, and there shall be none behind me. I am the God who flooded the earth in the days of Noah. And as the waters cover the earth, so shall my glory cover the earth in these end days. I search the world, I brood, my spirit broods over the earth now, searching for those who will stand in my name, those who will stand in my power and strength, and those who will march into the darkness. Right now, my spirit goes forth to and fro, searching the whole earth, building a holy network, an end time army whose strength and power the earth has never seen. Because I, the Lord of angel armies, have chosen this time to pour out my spirit. I have chosen you to hear the word of the Lord. And I call you to rise up. To rise up in power. To rise up in strength. To rise up and reveal what Jesus Christ means. Yeah. What it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. What it means to be a new creation. I have given you all things. I have sent my spirit back to dwell in you. And to sit upon you. And to be everything for you. Will you put him to work? Will you step out and march? Will you rise up and link arms and march forward yes. and declare the standard of Jesus Christ? Will you raise the blood-soaked banner of Jesus Christ and march into victory? Yes. Not battle, nay battle, but march into victory. Yes. March into victory. victory. Hallelujah, See Jesus. what your great God will do. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's love the Lord right now. Bless His name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Give the Lord a big hand this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. I'll tell you what the Lord... What the Lord is saying, He's looking for voices. Yes. Amen. Right here amongst us. He wants to be heard. He wants to be seen. He wants to be manifest. Yes. But it takes us to do that. Yes. He's depending on us. When the Lord speaks to you, when He moves on you, whether it's in the service or wherever, we've got to become sensitive enough and have enough courage to step out yes. and just take that step of faith. Yes. Say what he's saying. Yes. Do what he's telling you to do. Yes. Just move. And we're going to see the supernatural and the miraculous yes. in ways that we've only talked about and heard about. In fact, there'll be things that we've never even dreamed of yet. There is. Come on. There is. We're moving into that time now where God is going to move in the miraculous and the supernatural. And the, right. and the beauty of this is He's going to use us to do it. Praise the Lord. Give him another hand this morning. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Suzanne, Tammy, Mike, Jody, thank you all for leading us in worship. Praise God. God bless all of you for being here this morning. Appreciate you being part of the service today. All of you that are joining us online, God bless you, and we appreciate you being a part of the service as well. We uh, are grateful to have, uh, amen, you with us, amen. And as we always say, there's no distance with God, so wherever you are, 
We know that they are everywhere from Pakistan to uh, Arizona and Georgia and, I don't know, many other places, including Iowa. If I left you out, forgive me, because I just don't remember, praise the Lord. But God is good. Amen. And uh, we're grateful for the body of Christ. Amen. To come together in any way that we can. Praise God. God is good. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Good to see Caleb and the family. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Appreciate you being here. Darlene, he's here. Praise the Lord. I just thought I'd drop that in there for you. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. God is good, isn't he? Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to, uh, let's, just, let's just go to the word this morning. I, uh, you know, God has been speaking to me about more and more of, uh, of him and our pursuit of him. And, and that doesn't just mean, you know, uh, fasting and prayer and, and uh, reading the Bible, although those, all of those are all uh, things that we can be doing. But it's about really getting to know him, developing something beyond religion, something beyond just uh, getting to heaven, but hearing his voice. You know, uh, we're hearing more and more of how the prophets will, will, uh, will be so uh, important in these last days. They're always important, but, but, but even more so than ever before in the last days. And there's the office of the prophet, and we know that, and we're grateful for that, and we thank God for it. But there's also the body of Christ that needs to be prophesying. Paul said, I would that you all prophesy. And I'm not just talking about, you know, uh, I don't know, predicting the future. I'm talking about the Word of God. I'm talking about just being intimate enough with God that when He speaks to you, you can hear it and be willing to share it. Does that make sense to anybody? I mean, I'm just, I, I know that what God is wanting is, is intimacy with us. So much so that he can speak to us. You know, I don't know about it. I, I'm kind of personal and private. Uh, everything I say, like to my wife or to family, I don't expect them to be sharing that with everybody else. You know, you know what I'm saying? I don't always say, don't tell everybody this. I'm just assuming that this is personal. It's between you and me. And I don't want you telling everybody else, you know, this is just about us. It's about our relationship. Sometimes that's the way it is with God. Sometimes it's just you and him. He just wants to talk to you and it's not for everybody. But sometimes it is. And when it is, we need to be, have the courage to step up and say what it is he's saying. Share it. Because not everybody's hearing. Amen. He's speaking to everybody, but not everybody's listening. Praise the Lord. So in a kind of a convoluted uh, Nathan way, that's what I'm going to talk to you about this morning. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So good luck. Amen. No luck with God. I'm just saying you better. I hope you've prayed before you got here. Or you may go away completely confounded. Hallelujah. Amen. But anyway, God is good. And we appreciate everybody being a part of the service today. God bless you. And uh, may he bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin with John chapter 14 and verse 10. John chapter 14, verse 10. Praise the Lord. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Praise the Lord. Psalms 119 and 130. Psalms 119, 130. Praise the Lord. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. And you say, praise the Lord. 
Amen. Anybody, uh, anybody remember Amelia Bedelia? Praise the Lord. I, I warned you. Amen. And whether you remember her books uh, from when you were a kid or, or you read them to your kids or you read them to your grandkids. You remember the misadventures of a housemaid who follows every instruction to the letter. I mean, details. And when her employer asks her to dress the chicken, she sews this tiny little pair of overalls and fits them on the bird. And when she's told to put out the lights, she unscrews all the light bulbs from the fixtures and, and then she hangs them on the backyard clothesline. Now, even kindergartners laugh at this. I mean, they can see the idiocy, you know, the kind of confusion involved, right? The mistakes that Amelia Bedelia makes. And she's making these mistakes because she doesn't grasp how language works. She doesn't get it, right? And we can have the same problem with the Bible and with the voice of God. Because language uh, has, has culture, it has context. And God, there's a God culture. I'm not talking about religion now. I'm talking about God and how he relates to us. The context in which we relate to one another. I mean, if you just think about the English language, which is pretty <laughs> weird in itself, you can't decipher phrases like uh, beat around the bush, kick the bucket, get someone's goat. Amen. Amen. You can't, you're not going to figure those out by breaking down word by word the sentence. It won't make any more sense to you after that than it did when you heard it the first time, right? You have to catch a person's drift, praise the Lord. You need to know the culture and the context in which it's being spoken. Yes. Amen. There's natural and there's spiritual. That's the cultures I'm talking about this morning. There's the supernatural and just the natural. There's the flesh and there's the spirit. There's the intellect and there's the spirit. Jesus called it having a single eye. Matthew 6, uh, 22 and 23. And this doesn't take as I'm trying to explain, it's not a, a question of uh, intellect or IQ. It's a question of sensitivity to the spirit. And that's why he said, you know, even a child can understand this. They can grasp it. They can understand it in their own way, right? Mm -hmm. In their own context, in their own, if you will, culture as a child, right? The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. So, in other words, if you don't get it, how confused are you going to be when it's all said and done, right? I mean, the less you understand, the less you relate, the more confused and the more darkness you're going to see. I mean, almost when you, when you read Amelia Bedelia, it's almost like a religious response to the spirit. Uh -huh. I mean, she's getting instructions, but she's receiving them in a certain way. And so she goes out and tries to literally do what it is she's being told to do, even though she doesn't understand the context or, or the culture with, <laughs> that it's being spoken to. And that's kind of what religion has done in a lot of ways. It, it tries to do something spiritual in a natural way. It tries to do something supernatural in a, in a natural and human uh, context. Amen. For, when Abram was about to sacrifice Isaac, amen, what God provides a ram in his place, right? Look, let's look at this quickly. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 14, just so you'll see that I'm not uh, stretching this at all. So Abram's getting ready to, to obey God. God had told him, you know, I, I'm, I want you to give your son, your only son, right? The son that's supposed to be the beginning of a whole uh, 
nations of people, right? And Abram called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. Why? Because God provided the ram, right? Instead of, have, instead of him having to give his son. And uh, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. So God provided a ram in the place of Isaac. And so Abram names the mountain, literally Jehovah Jireh, and the actual translation or the, uh, the literal translation of that is the Lord will see. Praise the Lord. The Lord will see. And what Abraham meant by that was that when God sees our need, he will definitely respond to it. Amen. And Jesus' message, he promised his followers that if they had a good eye, right? If they were seeing things in the proper perspective, if they were seeing things the way they were meant to be seen, their lives would be illuminated from within. In other words, God would be, would be witnessing with them. He would be leading them and guiding them, right? Seeing from God's perspective is, is recognizing and understanding God's faithfulness to his word. Amen? Yeah. The more you read the scripture, the words of Jesus in context of faith, the more you understand that Jesus is speaking in a context, he's speaking in a, in a way that all relates to faith. And if you're reading it in any other way other than it developing faith in you, then you're missing the point. Mm -hmm. You're going to get some, a bunch of information, but it's all going to be disjointed and disconnected. It won't produce what it's supposed to produce. Mm -hmm. It will get something done, but it won't be what, what God intended it to do. Right. It'll be your own interpretation. Mm -hmm. Amen? The more, the more that we discover that Jesus is speaking in the context of faith, the more we need to learn to have a very good eye. To be reading the Word of God as though God is speaking to you personally. Not just some general terms, not just randomly, but He's speaking to you for a purpose and to you personally for that purpose. You know, <laughs> praise the Lord. In the written word, so when you go and read the Bible, you can read it, you know, like it's a comic book or it's a newspaper, or you can read it as if it's God speaking to you. That's right. And in the written word, the opening words or the first lines need to be memorable. If you ever take a, a, a writing class or a, a literature uh, in school, that first, those first lines have to be like a gunshot. Right. It's like bang, right? Yeah. And so it has to be powerful enough that after the smoke clears, the reader is going to continue reading on with that shot still ringing in their ear. Right. In other words, motivating them for more information, right? right. Uh, let me just give you, while I was thinking about this, the Lord reminded me of some things. So let me, let me give you some first lines to just show you what I'm talking about. We started dying before the snow, and like the snow, we continued to fall. That's the first lines from Tracks. It was a, a book by Louise Erdich. Mm. It was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking 13. 1984, George Orwell. Of all the things that drive men to the sea, S-E-A, the most common disaster I've come to learn is women. <laughs> I had to throw that one in. That's from a, a book called Middle Passage by Charlie Johnson. <laughs> now, let me just ask you something. Would you read those first lines? It, 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 it isn't just like, oh boy, here we go. No, you read those lines and you want to know what in the world is this going to lead to? Right. Where is this going to take me? That's what, that's what a book is supposed to do. That's what writing is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. If it's just, you know, like the Des Moines Register, yeah. well, it'll probably get as much reading as the Des Moines Register gets. Yeah. 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 But if it sparks something in you, if it, if it creates a, you know, a question in your mind or a sense of, man, I want to know more about this. I want to figure this out. I want to understand what's going on here. I want to see 
the results of what this is leading me to, yeah. then it's accomplished the purpose that, that writing is supposed to bring. Amen? Right. So let me just show you now. Imagine you haven't read the Bible, right? Imagine it's like uh, one of these books that I just read a first line from that maybe you haven't read yet. But you read the first line and, and you're thinking, I kind of like to get a hold of that book to see what that's all about. You know? All right, so let's look at this in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And I'll show you what God is speaking to me. He told me this years ago. He said, unless you pick this book up and you read it like you've never read it before, right. it's never going to mean any more to you than it does to anybody else in religion. You're going to have to start looking for answers to questions and start getting drawn into what I'm trying to say in a way that's personal, in a way that's more than just I belong to this group of people or this denomination or this thing, right? But it becomes personal to me, right? So in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Okay, so that's the first time you've ever read that, right? Don't know anything about it. You just pick up a book, and that's what you read. And what is John doing? He's pulling us in. Who's this mysterious word? It's kind of weird to have a name, the word. Is it a person? Is it a thing? Is it a what? And why does John link him this word to God and the beginning of the whole world. Yeah. Can you see the, the genius, really? I mean, I'm talking about the author of this book is God. Yeah. He just gives this stuff to men and men just write it down. But I'm telling you, this guy could sell it. In fact, he has the greatest selling yeah. book that's yeah. ever been written. Yeah. Yes, he does. Praise the Lord. So here it is, we're, we're, we're saying, who, who, who's this mysterious, this strange, this word, who is this? And, and how's he connected to God in the beginning of all of this creation and everything, right? So you're, you think, okay, well, I've got this book, I, and, and what do you do? Well, you, you, you just page back until you, until you find the beginning to find out what this thing is saying, Right? So you go to the opening lines, you end up all the way back in Genesis chapter 1. And what does he tell us in Genesis 1, verses 1 through 3? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Hmm. This word. It's getting interesting. Praise the Lord. See, in Genesis, God creates the world by simply speaking it into being. Light out of darkness. Something from what seems to be nothing. And then it occurs... In the New Testament, Jesus speaks words that prove to be uniquely powerful, mm -hmm. strangely powerful. Mm -hmm. Look at Mark chapter 4 and verse 39. I'm hoping to sell some Bibles. Praise the Lord. Mark chapter 4, verse 39. He arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Matthew 9, verse 6 and 7. For he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. Matthew 9, 6 and 7. It's the healing but that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. 
So everything he says communicates God. Everything he's doing, this word, every word that he's speaking is communicating God, is, is, is showing God, is revealing God. Mm-hmm. And yet, for all of that, we don't always understand him. Sometimes because of culture and context, sometimes because we're reading from a natural, right. human, uh, carnal perspective, yeah. we're not seeing what it is he's actually telling us. We're not really getting what it is he's trying to communicate to us. Amen? Isaiah 43, verse 19. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Isaiah 45, verses 5 through 8. Indulge me, okay, folks? I think, you know, God just wants to be different once in a while. He wants to get your attention. He wants this to not just be the same, quote the scripture and let's move on. I'm saying we we hear it, but we're not. We're hearing, but we're not receiving. And so he's trying to get our attention. Amen. And so I'm the Lord and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. That they may know me, or that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west, that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Now, are you listening to these words? Dop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, and let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Now, some of the most important truths of the Bible are paradoxes. I mean, did you actually read what I just read? They're paradoxical. Jesus is both fully human and fully man. God is loving and fully in control and yet he allows tragedy and injustice takes place in the land. God is everywhere but at certain times he's present in a unique way in a specific place. Whether it's us when we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit Christ in you, the hope of glory, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, when the glory fills the temple. Mm -hmm. Jesus liked to speak in paradoxes. I mean, if you're just a cursory reading of the New Testament and you're going, my God, what is he, what's going on here? He's trying to suck us into the, into the, to the words, into the truth, into the language, into the communication. In other words, he's wanting you to think on a spiritual level. Mark chapter 9, verse 35. It makes me feel a whole lot better that a lot of times I'll preach a message and people walk away saying, oh, that was great. And then I I know what they're saying afterwards. And I don't know what the hell he was talking about. (laughs) That didn't make any sense. Right? It's okay, I'm in good company. (laughs) He sat down and called the twelve, and he said unto them, If any man desire to be first, the same shall be last of all, and a servant of all. Want to be first? Get to the back of the line. Really? John 12, verse 25. He that loveth his life will lose it. 
He that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. Yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. John 6, verse 37. And then we wonder why when unbelievers, a lot of times they'll say, you know, I've tried reading the Bible. It just doesn't make any sense. Right. And the truth is, if we were completely honest, we'd have to say, well, sometimes it doesn't be either. Right. If I'm just reading it right. from the natural context and natural. Right. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draws him and I'll raise him up the last day. Hallelujah. Well, here's the story. Making sense of everything is not an obligation. It's not even a possibility. And believe me, God doesn't do things by accident. Acceptance of mystery is an act not of resignation. It's an act of faith. Praise the Lord. Being able to accept the paradox allows us to embrace Jesus in ways that we otherwise could not. Because this is beyond human intellect. This is a God talking to the God that's in you to the spirit. It's spirit to spirit. Yes. Yep. If I focus on Jesus as a man, I miss Jesus as God. Yeah. If I focus on Jesus as God, then I miss Jesus as a man. Mm -hmm. Is he God or is he man? As with all paradoxes, the answer is yes, yes. It's not natural. You're not going to learn this in biology. Look at John chapter 5, verse 39. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Jeremiah 29, verse 13. Jeremiah. 29, verse 13. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye search for me with all of your heart, mm -hmm. not just your intellect. 2 mm -hmm. Peter 1, verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Take heed, he says. Listen so that you can understand the light of revelation. Right? Yeah. And tell that day star, until God is revealed, this day star, right? Before we were born again, and I may be taking some, uh, I, may, I may be overstepping my bounds here, but I'm speaking for me, and I think I've talked to enough people to know that most of us come about this in the same way. Before we were born again, whether we knew it or not, we were searching for God whether it was drugs, alcohol, sex, relationships, right. money, importance, acceptance. In everything that we did, we were looking for God. We were looking for answers. Yeah. Answers that only God could give in Jesus, right. in His Word. Right. But we didn't know we were looking. We didn't know where to look, we were just looking. Right. In our search, in a strange way, I'm going to go off again. We were like explorers. 
we were like uh, trekkers, trekkies, amen. We were like explorers of the stars, mm -hmm. stars that rule the darkness, stars that light up the darkness, that make some sense out of our darkness. And in our search for God and faith, we seek each deity. See, the stars rule the darkness. I'm making a metaphor here, so don't get too lost in it, but I'm just saying, in our search for God and faith, we, we seek each deity of every pantheon of the gods. Because believe me, if you're getting drunk every day, alcohol has become your god. Right. If you're shooting up, smoking dope, doing all the other stuff constantly, I mean, if that's your whole thing, that, that has become your God. That's right. And pick any of the others that I already mentioned, they can become the same thing. We're looking for answers from these things, from these stars in the darkness, right. thinking that they're going to give us the answers that only God can give us. Right. We're looking for God, we just don't know that we're looking for God. The world out there that we look at and are so disgusted with are no different than we were. And such were some of you, Jesus said. The forces that controlled the energies that are made available by worshiping them. Am I, does that make sense? In other words, the satisfaction, the momentary, the temporary satisfaction or, or, or good feeling or whatever it is that I'm getting. I'm getting from this energy, from this force that I am worshiping. The place that each one of them hold in the power struggle of nature and being. Whatever the thing is, multiple things for most of us. We're looking for that, we're searching for that until we finally arrive at a place that's beyond them. From where we can look back and say, their power is an illusion. It's not real, it's not permanent. It's not lasting. It's not really even satisfying. Right. Right. It's an illusion. They're nothing more than conduits. The agencies of a perfect, transcendent, oneness God who pervades the universe. Yeah. There's something, in other words, that God actually uses. They're not God, they're idols, they're agencies, they're conduits, yeah. but God uses them so that when we get fed up with it, when we get to the other side of them, when we get to the place where they no longer satisfy us the way we want them to, where they become controlling us and we can look back and say, they're not even real, mm -hmm. they're not gods. And from that perspective, we begin to see the miracles of God, God, miracles that are done for believers, people being healed, people being delivered, people being set free, people getting saved. Wonders that have engaged every force of nature together in unison. All that connected heaven and earth as one. All of those things, and we go, in a way, that's God. Because he'll use the evil, he'll use the worst, he'll use the, the most negative to reveal himself, to bring himself into our lives. Wind and waves, sickness and disease, sin and evil, the calming the healing, the deliverance. He uses those things 
to reveal himself. He doesn't make those things. He just takes advantage of them. And that's when we know that we've arrived at truth. And with that revelation is the secret of every false lying spirit, of every false power. The wisdom that emerges from darkness. That's how the word of God would enter the world. The wisdom that came from darkness. Everything was dark and void and confused and a word came and brought light, brought revelation, brought a witness of God's reality, of his existence. That's how he entered our word. That's how he comes into our world by his word. Now let me tell you something. The darkness that we found can teach us more about light than light could ever say. I didn't have to have somebody come tell me, you need to get your act together. I'd had enough darkness to know I need some light. And had light just come, the light wouldn't have taught me near as much as the darkness had already taught me. If I live in light, I don't realize I need light. It isn't until I'm in darkness and light comes that I recognize I could use some more of that. Right? So we curse the darkness. But actually, the darkness tells us more about light than light could ever tell us. Our, our bondages, our sins, our sickness, our disease tell us far more about God than God can even tell about himself. Malachi 4, 1 through 3. We're looking at all the stars, trying to find the day star, right? Malachi says, Behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with... Anybody know what the sun is? It's a day star. Mm -hmm. It's a star that we see during the daytime. And the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings and you will go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And you shall tread down the wicked and they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. When we find (laughs) that day star, when he arises, that revelation comes, the son of righteousness arrives the day star. They're one and the same. Yes. And what's the result? We overcome every wickedness. Come on. Every darkness. Right. Praise the Lord. Yes. I'm saying how many times I've read this and got bits and pieces but got more instruction on on effort or or energy to expend than I did about what's already been done. Mm -hmm. And how God used my life, my life, my my messes, my selfishness, my priorities to become the priority. When our spiritual lives seem to flow smoothly, we may think that uh, we've overcome the challenges of life, and now we can just sit back and relax. You know, I was thinking earlier this past week, you know, things are good. Yeah, there's still stuff happening, but you know, 
I got the Lord and it's all good. It's all decent. And I kind of, you know, just relax a little, take it easy. But what the Lord said to me was, uh, what about tomorrow? Mm-hmm. See, I, even when we feel like we've reached the pinnacle of spirituality, there's still tomorrow. Yeah. Now, we don't know what tomorrow is. That's right. Living in this world, I can promise you, it can be pretty bad. It could get pretty ugly and pretty stupid in a hurry. So let me go back to Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19 again. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. That's what the Lord actually said in the tongues and interpretation that we heard this morning. That's why I had the tongues and she had the interpretation. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Otherwise, you'd you'd think I was baiting you. Praise the Lord. (laughs) But behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Mm -hmm. Rivers. Come to the river. Looks like a desert, Lord. Take off those earth goggles. Yes. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Looking through the eyes of faith. Yes. So here we are. You know, it's January. And we say a year is 365 days. But in the original scripture, in the Hebrew, it's called a Shana. And it contains a secret, a mystery. It's connected to the number two. It can mean the second, the duplicate, or the repeat. And in the natural realm, in the realm of of astrophysics, you know, just the the nature, a year is a repetition of what's already been. The revolving of the earth around the sun. Here we go again, right? Right? The coming of winter, spring, summer, fall. The blossoming of flowers, gardens. Sally can tell you all about it. Uh, All I know is how to figure out which one's a weed. Right? If I pulled it, it's a flower. Flowers blossom, and then they wither away. The rebirth of nature, and then it dies. The same progression, the same replaying of what already has been. So a year is a shana, is the repetition of the past. Well, now we've got a new year, and it's all before us at this point. What kind of year is it going to be? Well, what do you mean, Nathan? Come on. The nature of nature is to repeat. Just the same as the way we live. We're nature. By nature, we are creatures of habit. We gravitate toward what we've done before. Same routine, the things we're comfortable with, things we're used to. Habits, routines. Even when those routines, even when those habits are harmful to us or unproductive, we have a tendency to want to repeat them anyway. So what will Shema this coming year that's before us right now what is this Shana going to bring? Well, if the year means the repeat, we don't really have much of a choice, do we? Right. It'll be mostly the same as the one that was before. But here's the beauty of it. Yeah. We do have a choice. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I said the word Shana has a double meaning. Yes. It not only means the repeat, 
it also means the change. Yes. It's almost an Amelia Bedelia. Yeah. <laughs> How can the same word have opposite meanings? It's a paradox. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yes. The same way the year ahead of us can be the opposite yes. of the year we just had. Yes. The way of the world is to repeat. But the way of God is the way of newness and change. Yes. Romans 6 and 4. Therefore, we're buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Yes. See, you can't really know God and not be changed by knowing him. You can know about him, you can know of him, but you can't really know him without it having an impact on you, without it changing you. His will is that the year, the Shana ahead of us, not be a time of repetition, but a time of change, of new beginnings, of new steps, yes. of breaking out of the old ways and the old nature. We need the first lines of this year to be powerful enough yes. that it grasps yes. our attention. Yes. Amen. Yes. That it will grasp our imagination yes. and call us deeper into the Lord, into our relationship. If you want to see a year of new things, you have to choose to live not in the natural. And you have to choose to not walk by nature in all of its oldness mm -hmm. and its repetitions. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. But to choose to live in the supernatural and walk in the power of God. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So we need to learn and choose to walk in the will and the power of God who makes all things new. Yeah. We have to live on earth in the power of heaven. Yes. And we'll walk in newness of life. And the year ahead of us will be Shana of change. Yes. A year of newness. Yes. A year of the word of God dominating. Yes. So I'm not done with this. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Which is it going to be? Now, a tale of two cities, by the way. But Entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Psalms 119, 133 through 35. 133 through 135, I'm sorry. Psalms 119 again. This will be the last scripture. 133 to 135, please. 119. Order my steps in thy word. And let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Deliver me from the oppression of man. Yes. So will I keep thy precepts. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant. And teach me thy statutes. Yes. Trust the Lord. And let the word fight for you. Right. And bring a new year. A spiritual supernatural year yes. a year of God yes. a year of new beginnings yes. <laughs> praise the Lord a year of the supernatural yes. praise God pick this up and when you don't understand it say thank you Jesus I believe it anyway yes. right. trust him to reveal to you what is most important to him 
and therefore for you. Let the negatives, let those things that still haunt you bring you to light. Yeah. Tell you how much better the light is right. than the darkness. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm thinking about Ray and Eric. Mm -hmm. These are dark times for them. Yeah. But God has not abandoned them. That's right. He's just praying. That's right. He's just declaring yeah. that that darkness yeah. yes. will cause them to shout, Light yes. be. Yes. And that word will bring a whole new creation to their life. That's what he's done for each and every one of us to yes. some degree in some way or another. Yes. That's how he operates. Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Happy New Year. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. Y'all are dismissed in Jesus' name. Have a great new year beginning today. Amen. In Jesus' name.